Well, as again, I said, today is actually Easter Sunday, the Resurrection Sunday, and it has been my custom over the years uh, to preach a sermon about the resurrection. We could do it every day, actually. I love it. But today I'd like to look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, which reads, Remember that Jesus Christ, of the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. And in order to really grasp what Paul is commanding Timothy here to remember Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection, we need to set this verse in its context. Uh, and 2 Timothy is the very last letter Paul will write before his death. He's in a Roman prison for the second time and the last time, and he will soon lose his head but again, eternal life with Christ. And he's writing to Timothy, who is his protege, if you will, or his son in the faith. And, and Timothy is a young minister of the gospel who Paul has sort of taken under his wing, but Timothy is a timid fellow. And Paul writes this letter to encourage him and to equip him and challenge Timothy to keep forging forward with the gospel. Uh, Paul is leaving soon. Uh, he, he won't be with him much longer, uh, but God is going to always be with him. So he encourages him to keep the faith, persevere in trials, persevere in suffering. And clearly, Paul being on death row, also, clearly many know of Timothy's relationship with Paul, kind of being his right-hand man, could have made Timothy all the more nervous, all the more fearful. Which is why Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, he said to Timothy, not to be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God. Uh, so in chapter 2, verses 3 to 6, Paul will give him three analogies, if you will, of persevering in suffering. That of being a good soldier, that of being a competitive athlete, and that of being a hard-working farmer. Uh, and as he, he, he thought on what he was called to do and, and who it was who called him to do it, uh, that, that he would stay the course. He would stay the course that he would continue to guard the deposit that he was entrusted with, which, of course, is the gospel. And like Paul, be faithful unto the end. Uh, and, and to help him with this, he says to him, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Uh, and, and remember is in the present imperative, which means it's a command. It's a command, and it's a command that is always to be obeyed, so always to be remembered. And what I'd like to do today with the Lord's help is look at this verse by remembering three things uh, about Jesus in a sermon titled, The Resurrection Remembered. And those three things are remember his person, remember his victory, and finally, remember his gospel. His person, his victory, his gospel. And so first, remember his person. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David. Now, when Paul says, remember Jesus Christ, he's not saying this because Timothy is in danger of forgetting who Jesus is or that he's in danger of forgetting that he was crucified and rose from the dead. But rather, remember what he accomplished. Remember what he came to do and that right now he is alive. Remember that. And that he is reigning on high and he is with you and he will never leave you nor forsake you. So remember Jesus Christ. And many people think that Jesus Christ was his first name and last name. They think Jesus Christ, first name, last name, but they're not. Jesus was his name, Christ was his title. When the angel came to Joseph to tell Mary uh, to take Mary as his wife, even though she was with a child, uh, he said in Matthew 1.20, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Then he says in verse 21, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sins. So Jesus means Savior. It means Savior. All right? And he came on a mission to save his people. Save his people. Uh, Jesus said of himself in Matthew 18, For the Son of Man has come to save, to save that which was lost. He said in Luke 9, 56, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. We read in Hebrews 7, 25, that Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the angel said in Luke 2, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior 
who is Christ the Lord. And there are many other verses stating that Jesus is the Savior. And the question we need to ask is, what is he saving us from? And then why, why do we even need to be saved from it? And the short answer is, he's saving us from the penalty of our sins, which is an eternal death. Uh, and he's saving us from the judgment to come and from the wrath of God. Uh, and the reason he has to save us from those things is because we can't save ourselves from those things. For as Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. As Ezekiel 18.20 says, the soul that sins shall die. And that would include all of humanity, minus Jesus, of course. All of humanity, minus Jesus. For Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So it's impossible for men to save themselves. It's impossible to gain heaven, to gain eternal life on your own. Jesus told a rich young ruler who wanted to find everlasting life. That was his question. How do I have everlasting life? Right? He wants to know that. Uh, and Jesus says to him, if he wants everlasting life, he needs to get rid of his idol. He needs to get rid of the God of his heart, which of course is his money, and follow Jesus. Well, after the young man hears that, he walks away from Jesus. He's very sorrowful uh, because he's unwilling. He is unwilling to part with his idol. Uh, and so Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew 19, he says, listen, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And that astonishes his disciples because to them, the more you had, the richer you were, that means the more blessing that God was pouring upon you. And that meant the closer to heaven you were. So to them, the rich were abundantly blessed by God and had great favor with God. And so when Jesus says, rich people are, are as far as can be. Because they, they thought surely the rich would inherit eternal life. So they say to Jesus in verse 25, well then who can be saved? If this rich guy can't be saved, who can be saved? And he replies in verse 26, with men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So it is impossible for a person to earn heaven. It is impossible for a person to merit heaven on their own. It cannot be gained by effort. It cannot be gained by good works. It cannot be gained by lineage. You're born into a Christian family, we'll say. It, it cannot be gained by your smarts. Oh, I understand the gospel. It cannot be gained that way. It cannot be gained by being religious. But only through Jesus the Savior. Only through Jesus the Savior. So he is Jesus, which means a Savior. And he is called the Christ, which means anointed one, which means Messiah. And from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God has promised to send the Messiah, the one who would deliver men from their enemies, which are our own sin, our enslavement to sin, the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and that we're under the condemnation of sin. You see, after Adam fell in the garden, after he sinned against God, and all of his offspring, which we are part of, fell in him, the Lord gave a promise of redemption when he said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So this epic showdown, if you will, for souls is set up from the very beginning and will be battled out at the cross where Christ, who is the seed of the woman, will destroy the works of the devil by giving him the death blow while at the same time redeeming his elect. But it would cost him. It would cost him the suffering and the agony of the cross or the bruising of his heel. Besides Genesis 3, we see prophecies of the Messiah throughout the whole Old Testament which is why, why the Jews were waiting for him for centuries. They were, waiting, they were looking for him. They were waiting for him. So like, for instance, in Psalm 2, we read in verses 7 to 9, where the Lord says, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. And Isaiah 9, 6 and 7 says that the government will be upon his shoulders and there would be no end to the increase and peace of it. 
Micah 5.2, we see where he would be born, Bethlehem. Zechariah 9.9, he's coming as a king, uh, and that he is just and having salvation. We read in Daniel chapter 7, verses 14, where he says that he would be given dominion and glory and a kingdom, and all the peoples and the nations and languages shall serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which should not pass away nor be destroyed. So the Jews were waiting for the Messiah. And sadly, today they still are waiting for the Messiah because they rejected Jesus for the most part when he came. Because they were looking for a military Messiah, one who would free them from the bondage and slavery of Rome and grant them world dominance here and now. Jesus didn't come to free them from the bondage of Rome, but rather from the bondage of their sin. He couldn't see that. He came to reconcile sinners to God, to set them free, as we read in Romans, from the law of sin and death. And the Jews didn't think they needed that. Uh, for they were Jews. They were from Abraham, automatically in the kingdom of God. So they were good with God, for they were the people of God. He was his people. Well, Christ came for sinners, whoever they are, and wherever they are. Well, Christ came, we read, to be a propitiation for men's sins. We read in John, uh, 1 John 2, 2, propitiation, big word, satisfaction. Came to be an appeasement. He came to satisfy God's justice for us. Everybody's got this picture of God in the day we live that God is like grandpa, just loves us all to death and can't, can't do enough for us. He is a God of love. Praise God he's a God of love. He's not a God of love. We're in, we're in deep trouble, right? But he's a God of justice. He's a God of wrath. He's, a, he's, he's holy. He hates sin. People say, how do you know he hates sin? I said, look at the cross. That's how much he hates it. He put his own son to death for it. Came to be a propitiation. Isaiah 49 says he came to bring sinners back to God. Isaiah 53 says he came to bear our griefs, to carry our sorrows, to be wounded for our transgressions, to be bruised for our iniquities. That's spiritual stuff. That's taking, taking, taking our sin away and paying the price for it stuff. He came to make peace between us and God. Why do we need peace, we say? Know it or not, we're at war with God. We're sinners, God is holy. God is just, his word is holy and just. We break his, his holy word. We're at war with God. We're separated from God. Jesus came to take away the separation, to make peace for us, so that we could be righteous before God. So the Christ, the Messiah of God, was the very son of God. And the Jews only saw the Messiah as a man, like David was a man, like Moses was a man. Uh, but he indeed is also the Son of God, which of course means he is eternal God. He is God, God in the flesh. And he said he was God. He said he was God in John 8, 58. When he said before Abraham was, he said, I am. And I am is the title for Yahweh or the self-existent one or the eternal one. And only God could have this title. It was when Moses, when God told Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh and the people of Israel and say, uh, you know, let my people go. And, and Moses, well, who am I going to say is sending me? Like, well, what do I tell them? Who are you anyway? What should I say? Tell them I am who I am has sent you. And so I am means eternal, everlasting God, the self-existing and sufficient one. And when Jesus says I am, he's saying I am the self-eternal, existing one. In Matthew 16, 16, uh, he asks the apostles, who do men say that I am? And they say, well, you know, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, some say you're Jeremiah, and some say you're one of the prophets. Jesus says to them, well, who do you say that I am? Peter steps up and he says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, so the Christ is the Son of God who is also the King. The King. When Jesus was on trial before Pilate, Pilate says, so are you a king? I'm hearing this king language. Are you a king? Jesus' answer in Matthew, John 18, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, guess what, Pilate? My servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to you. But now my kingdom is not from here. Well, where is his kingdom then? Right now? 
It's in the heart of every single believer. You, Christian, the kingdom of God is in you. When he comes back, he'll consummate that and put us all together. Amen? But right now, the kingdom of God is all over the place because it's in his people. It's in his people. Well, Paul says, remember Jesus Christ who was of the seed of David. Uh, and this, this puts all doubts away, answers all questions about his humanity because some say he wasn't a man. He's just like a spirit floating around it, like a man's body. Right? Uh, but, but he was a man. Jesus was a man like you and I. Right? He was of the lineage of David. And in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, and Matthew was a Jew, and he's writing to Jews. So to Jews, it is absolutely critical what your lineage is. They're not going to listen to you. They're not going to read this gospel of yours unless you start from the beginning. I want to know lineage. It's a big deal. I thought to myself when I preached through Matthew, like who would start a book with like so-and-so begot, so-and-so begot, so-and-so begot. Like this is super-duper boring, right? No critical to the Jew. They're not reading it if they don't know the lineage. And so we, we read in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. The son of David. And David was told by God in 2 Samuel 7 that from his descendants would be one who would sit on his throne forever. So David knew it had to be a man, but no ordinary man. Galatians 4.4 4 says that when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. And it was critical that he be a man, critical that he be a man. He had to be one of us. He had to identify with us in order to save us, right? He had to experience what we experience, yet without sin, without sin, uh, he had to be like us in every way, but without sin. And, 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 and as a man, he had to be pure and holy. And there are so many scriptures that talk about him being sinless, uh, that, that he was just exactly that. And one is Hebrews 4.15 where it says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who was tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Yet without sin. And Jesus ultimately needed a body so that he could die for our sins, uh, so that he could be a substitute for us, right? I mean, the wages of sin is death. The soul that sins, it shall die. And Adam was told in Genesis 2 that if he ate of the forbidden tree, that he would surely die. Uh, So the consequence of sin is death, physical death. That comes into the world once Adam sins, right? Spiritual death, we're separated from God. We're spiritually dead, right, before we're saved. And then ultimately eternal death. For those who leave this world spiritually dead, well, they're, they're eternally, they eternally die in a place called hell. Uh, so the consequence of sin is death. Uh, and, 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 and God had showed the Jews, he showed the Jews from, from the time of the tabernacle in the wilderness that the only way sin could be forgiven or atoned for, the only way it could be, it could be eliminated, if you will, was through a sacrifice. It was through a sacrifice, which is why we read in, in Leviticus 7, 17, 11, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement, forgiveness, washes away, right, for the soul. Or as the writer of Hebrews would say, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So they needed to be a life sacrificed for the life of the sinner. They needed to be death for forgiveness. They needed to be death for life. And God can't die. God is eternal. And so Jesus, who is the Son of God, needed a body, needed to be like us in order to die for us. So God sent His Son, who is eternal God, to take on a second nature, human nature, right? He never ceases being God. God can't cease to be. He's 100% God, and He's 100% man. One person, two natures. He's not 50% God, 50% man, not 80, 20. No, he's 100, 100. All right, he's all God, he's all man. One person, two natures. He's always been God, and in time he took on a second nature, humanity. And right now, and forevermore, he is all God and all man. He would need both to save us, right, to be our mediator, to step in between us and God. So concerning his body, we read in Hebrews 10.5, Therefore, 
when he, Jesus, came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body, a body you have prepared for me. Because I'm the sacrifice. I'm the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I'm the one that's going to be the once for all time sacrifice to eradicate sin for your people forevermore. We're not going to keep doing sacrifices after sacrifices after sacrifices after sacrifices for 1,500 years. We don't have to do that anymore because once for all time, Jesus will pay the price in his own body at the cross. A body so he could become one of us and live a life perfecting the law of God which condemns us. You understand the law condemns you and I. Right? The law of God condemns us as sinners, and we sin all the time in what we think in our minds and what we say with our words and what we do. Jesus needed a body. He had to become one of us so that he could perfect the law, that he could ace the law, that he could, he could live perfectly the law and then give us, put over to us, impute on us that perfect life. This is critical. You need his forgiveness of sins, and that's him dying on the cross, you and shedding his blood for you. But you also need a right standing, a perfect standing before a holy God, and you ain't got that either. Right? None of us have it. Jesus gives us both. His life was critical so he could fulfill the law, besides die a sacrifice for us, and then give us, impute to us, credit towards us, that perfect life. He had to be born a man so he could be our representative so that he could represent us, right? Even as we're res represented by Adam in the Old Testament, right? All men are represented by Adam or from Adam. Those who trust in Christ are represented by him. And we see that in Romans 8, 15, which we read. Therefore, as through one man's offense, that's Adam, judgment came to all men. We're all sinners. We've inherited from our first father. We're all condemned because of it. Bad news resulting in condemnation, he says. Even so, through one man's righteous act, that's Jesus Christ on the cross, the free gift came to all men who would believe, resulting in justification of life. Not guilty. Not guilty. Declared pure and holy before, the, before God in the holy court of heaven. So since we were all in Adam, we were all under sin, but those who are in Christ are all under grace. Amen to that one? I hope so. So first of all, remember his person. Secondly, remember his victory. Again, 2 Timothy 2.8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead. Was raised from the dead. All of Christianity hangs on those five words. Was raised from the dead. Hangs on it. Right? They are what separate Christianity from every other religion in the world. From every other religious system in the world. Right. The, the first remember, remember his person, does not matter if Jesus was not raised from the dead. In fact, in fact, your faith is futile and the church is a sham. And we above all people are, are the most to be pitied if Christ didn't rise from the dead. But he did and he has and he was. He was raised from the dead. Uh, and for starters, when he says raised from the dead, implying in these, implied in these words is that he had to suffer and then die. And the scriptures tell us a lot about how Jesus suffered. And you may ask, well, if he was a man without sin, if he was pure and holy, uh, then why did he suffer? Then why did he suffer? Uh, and, and the answer is because sinful and unholy men hated him and hated his message. Uh, and they hated him because he called himself the Son of God. Uh, and because he made himself equal to God. Uh, they hated him because he said he could forgive sins, as we saw with the paralytic, uh, and because only God could forgive sins. And who is he saying that he could do what only God can do? They hated him because he said the only way to God was through him. Listen, it is, it is so narrow, the way to heaven. It, it is like the size of a postage stamp you've got to get through to get to heaven. Because Jesus said, I am the way. Not me and Buddha, Mohammed, the Pope, and any other way. I am the way. The way. One way. I am, I am the way. I am the truth. There's not a lot of truth out there. There's a truth. The truth. And I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The sad reality is the vast in humanity is trying to get there another way. 
Even and sadly, many who call themselves Christians trying to get there through their own good deeds won't work through Christ and Christ alone. They hated the message. They hated the messenger. They hated what he said. They, they hated, he said those things. They hated that he exposed them for who they were, which were self-righteous, works-driven hypocrites. Or as John 3.19 will say, and this is the condemnation. What is it, Jesus? That the light has come into the world, that's him, and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. You see what the light does? It exposes you for who you are. And that's ugly. And we don't like that. So we try to like shut the light out. Right? We try to like screw the bulbs out so we don't see any more light. But here's the reality. You're a sinner and your sin is an offense to a holy God and God is going to judge you for your sin and you have one hope and that is Christ. We don't like that. I want to live the way I want to live. I want to do what I want to do. I want to be sexually immoral. I want to be a liar. I want to be a thief. I want to be a cheat. I want to be all those things because I like it. And you like it. And you know you do. But when Christ shines that light of the gospel in the heart, it opens up. You don't want that anymore because now you got something better. Now you see you have a desperate need, but you got a much greater Savior who opens his arms and says, Come. Come, I will care for you. I will keep you. I will love you. I will give you my Holy Spirit so that you could live for me now and forever. So men mocked him. They slandered him. They lied about him. They tried to trick him. They wanted him to say something to condemn himself or, of course, for Rome to condemn him. They falsely accused him. They plotted and schemed and they arrested him. And they eventually had him put to death. Besides that, he was beaten to a bloody pulp. Isaiah 52, 14 says, he was beaten so badly. He was beaten so badly that his visage was marred more than any man. In other words, he was unrecognizable. He's like Rocky in Rocky 1 where they got to take the, the razor and cut his eye, oh, eye open. He's so puffed out. They beat him so badly you couldn't recognize him. I, and they spit on him, and they pulled out his beard, and they scourged him. And if, if you know anything about scourging, there was nothing more brutal than a scourging because it ripped the back open, and the flesh was flying, and nerves were exposed as shards of glass and metal were ripping pieces of the back out. Listen, 50-50, you died from the scourging, which is the reason Jesus couldn't carry the cross, right? It was the reason halfway through they had to give it to Simon of Cyrene because he was just too weak and too beaten and too much and taken out of him. His blood was flowing. And he couldn't do it. And Jesus wasn't going to die on the ground. He was going to die on the cross because God willed it that way. God willed it that way. Then they crushed, they crushed a, a, a crown of thorns into his skull, one inch thick, boom, pounded it in. And they took eight inch spikes and they drilled them through his wrist and drilled them through his feet. And he was abandoned even by his disciples. All his sheep scattered. So Jesus suffered as a man and at the hands of men. But you need to know, the greatest suffering he was experiencing was at the hands of God. And if you miss this, you miss it all. I remember many years ago, I don't know how many years ago now, 15, 20, whatever it was, when the movie The, the Passion came out, and everybody wanted to see I didn't want to see it. I said, I can't stand blood and guts. I don't, I'm not good. Like, I don't like blood. And, and so I didn't want to see it, but one of the elders at the church I was in said, no, no, we got to go see it, because if questions come up, we got to be able to answer it. And I said, I'll go. And, and technically, it was a very good movie. I mean, nothing, no movie I've ever seen depicted the scourging like that movie did. I mean, they really did a good job of depicting what happened with a Roman scourging. But the whole movie missed the main point. It wasn't just his physical suffering, as brutal as that was. It was, it was his suffering at the hands of God for the sins of his people. That was the greatest suffering. And if you miss that, you just feel sorry for a man that got beaten to a bloody pulp and nailed to a cross. But tens of thousands of people died on crosses. That was not a new thing. It was the mode of execution in Rome. So his greatest suffering happened at the hands of his father. Uh, for when he was on the cross, he's carrying upon himself the sins of all his people. Do you, do you ever think that all of your sins, if you're a believer today, all of your sins, they're on that cross. He's taken them up there with him. Now, he's... He's becoming responsible for them. He's taking your place 
and literally suffering God's wrath for them. That's what he's doing. And, and God must deal justly with the breaking of his law. So he pours out divine and holy justice upon his son. You, you grasp the fact that all of your sin is on him. And when the father sees your sin on his son, he ain't pleased with that. In fact, he's angry with that. In fact, he pours out justice on that and he levies it with all of the force of his anger and wrath upon his son, the one we loved. And he did it for you. Do you deserve that? Did you earn that? Are you worthy of that? Well, you better say no, 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 because we're not, right? And why did he do it? Love. God chose to love us. Jesus chose to love us. The Spirit chose to love us. He came to do it for us. He was condemned by God for the sins of those who would believe. He substituted himself. He said, I'll take it. Give it to me. I'll take it. He bore the fu full fury of it. So, even so, as Mark 15, 34 says, he's on the cross and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? But, but when he had drained down every last drop of the cup of the Father had given him to drink, he cries out those three beautiful, glorious, affirming, refreshing, encouraging words in English, not in Greek. It is finished. It is finished to the world. Oh, that's a cry of defeat. It is finished. He couldn't take it. Couldn't take it. No, it is finished. It is finished. The work is done. I have completed it. I have made the payment for my people in full. All their sins. I didn't miss a one. Every single one of the sins of every single one of my people, I've eradicated them. He didn't die for every single sin for every single people and person in all the world. If that were the case, every single person in all the world would go to heaven. Jesus didn't die for sins and someone else go to hell for them, right? Every single person that he died for, he paid them all. He didn't miss a one. And you know how we know that, by the way? The resurrection. Today affirms it is finished. It is finished. The work was done. The payment was made in full. All the sins of all his people washed away in his blood. And then we read he died and was buried. Uh, and, and, and as we know, by the power of God, he was raised from the grave three days later. Uh, and this wasn't done without men being aware of it. This didn't like, come out of the blue. Everybody knew it was coming, for the most part, because Jesus predicted his death and resurrection over and over again. He kept telling his disciples because they, they couldn't get it. Right? They were too overwhelmed with sorrow when he said, I got to die. But he even said it in other ways. And just to give you a few, in Matthew chapter 12, 39 to 40, the uh, he says to the scribes and Pharisees who wanted a sign, show us a sign in heaven. Show us something in heaven. But not that he wasn't doing miracles already, but they wanted to see something super duper spectacular. Like, you know, like, like, like write the Ten Commandments in the clouds or something. Like do something so out of the blue. But here's what he tells them. He says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And no sign will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Well, they knew the story of Jonah. They knew three days, three nights, he's out, right? The fish spits him out. Well, Jesus would be thrust out of the grave after three days. There's a sign. He said to the Jews after he cleansed the temple in John 2, he said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up three days later. And then verse 21 tells us he wasn't talking about the physical building talking about his body. Kill me, three days later, I'm going to raise it up. And even the Jewish leaders, his murderers, knew that he said he would rise three days later, which is why they, they went to Pilate after Jesus was put in the tomb, and they said, listen, you got to guard that tomb. You can't, you can't leave it unguarded. We read in Matthew 27, 16, they said, sir, this is the Pilate, we remember, they remember, they knew it, while he was still alive, how that deceiver said, after three days I will rise. They knew it. Not in secret here. So remember that Jesus was treated as an evildoer and that his followers will be treated the same way. Why would we think that we would just coast 
Oh, God saved me, and now I have like, I, I had the easy street to heaven. No. What comes first, the cross or the crown? Well, I hope you're going to say the cross, right? You're going to say the cross. But also remember that Jesus, Jesus Christ died and rose again, proving that his suffering leads to glory. And that seeming defeat leads to victory. Romans 1.4 says that he is declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. How is that, Paul? By his resurrection from the dead. And many can claim they're something. Many can even claim they're the Messiah. And by the way, there have been hundreds and hundreds of people over the, the, the two millennia who said they were the Messiah. Many can claim that, but Jesus proved it by rising from the dead. There's the proof. His resurrection guarantees he is the Son of God, that he is the Holy One, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that he is the door to glory, that he is the vine of life. John, when he wrote his gospel, he said he wrote his gospel so that men would believe that Jesus is the Son of God and be saved. The whole gospel of John was written with an evangelistic view so that you and I would read it and say, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior, and Jesus is a great Savior. He's a great Savior. But the resurrection also, also validates every single word written in the Word of God. For, for one, John tells us Jesus, or John 1 tells us Jesus is the Word. Uh, and it validates the claims that he made about himself, that he had authority to forgive sins. Like reading in Isaiah's prophecy about himself, the Messiah, in Luke 14 and Luke 4, 16 to 21. And then saying, guess what? This scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Like saying that all men were in darkness, but whoever believed in him would not remain in darkness, but he would give them light, for he is the light of the world. And that he is the bread which has come down from heaven, that he is the Lord of the Sabbath, that he was greater than David and Jonah and Solomon and everyone else in the Old Testament. Like saying whoever ate his flesh and drank his blood would have everlasting life. And we're not talking physical food here. We're not talking like, you know, like, like, like being, uh, you know, like, like, like eating sushi here. We're talking about whoever would, would trust in him and follow him and surrender to him and feed on him, spiritually speaking, would have everlasting life. So everything he said about himself and about his father and about the spirit and about heaven and about hell and about us, it's all true. And it's all going to happen. The resurrection proves it. He can't lie and then resurrect. And every promise he made has or will come to pass. Like that he, that he came that we would have life and have it more abundantly. Like all that the Father gave to him will come to him and, and, and that no one would be lost that would come to him. Like anyone who has left everything for his sake and for the gospel's sake shall be greatly blessed in this life and in the age to come have everlasting life. And like that he would be with us always, even to the end of the age. And so many more. And you could take it to the bank. You could take what he said to the bank because Jesus was raised from the dead. His resurrection also proves that he was sinless in his humanity. Uh, that he was innocent of every single sin that was laid upon him. You see, our sin didn't make him unholy. Right? It makes you and I unholy, but it never made him unholy. Yes, he paid the price. Yes, it was put on him but it didn't tarnish him. He just became a substitute. He just became a substitute. He was innocent of every sin that was laid upon him, which is why he couldn't be held by death. The grave couldn't hold him because he had no sin. The claws of death could not keep him in the grave. And corruption could not touch his pure and holy body for, for, for no sin of his own had defiled it. Psalm 16.10 says, for you will not leave, his him talking, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, that's the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So death could not keep him as a continual prisoner because he never came under sin himself. But he took our sins and he took them by imputation. That's a big word, it just means to credit. Listen, we give him our sins. That's what we're giving him. He gives us his righteousness, his holiness. Right? There's an exchange here, and we need them both. But because he was holy, he had to be set free from the grave once 
his imputed load was removed. So once he paid for all our sins, he can't stay in there anymore because holiness must rise. Life. The resurrection also proves that he paid the Pope price for our sins. And because if he didn't, he'd still be in the grave. Listen, if he missed one, if one got by, one sinful thought got by, one lustful thought, right? One greedful thought, one wicked word. If that got by, he'd still be in the grave. It proves also that he has all power and authority because of his victory at the cross. And we read this in, in Philippians 2 where it says that God highly exalted him and has given him the name which is above every name. Well, what's going to happen at that name? That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. So you understand what he's saying here? If you're an unbeliever, if you're an atheist, we'll say, if you're a fish shaker at God, you don't, want, you don't want Christ as your Lord. Maybe you're okay if he helps people and does some good teaching. If you won't bow to Jesus now, if you won't bow the knee as King Jesus, if you won't confess with the tongue King Jesus, well, on the last day, in the day of judgment, you will, and then he will cast you into the lake of fire. But Christians, we bow now. Not because no, no one's twisting our arm to bow, right? We confess now. No one's got a gun to our head saying, you know, say, say Christ is Lord. We do it. We say it. We proclaim it. Because we believe it. We've experienced it. And we love him. And we know it. God will be glorified that Jesus is king. And if you don't believe he's king now, you will claim it one day later. Oh, do it today. Like, why would somebody, like, put that off? Do it today. In 1 Peter chapter 3, 22, uh, says that Jesus has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. That's, a, that's all, the, all the spirit realm and all mankind. Everything is made subject to him. He's king. He's king of all. So Jesus, the God-man, is far above all rules and authorities and has all power and all dominion. Uh, well, not only does his resurrection prove his power and authority, it also assures us of his love for us. Again, Romans 8 says that, that he is the one who died for us and was risen for us and no one can separate us from his love. He can't love us any less than he loves us. And he loves us with all of his being, which is far beyond what you and I can grasp. And we can't make him love us less. Your sin doesn't diminish his love for you. Your inability, your foolishness, your lack of understanding does not diminish his love for you. Isn't that amazing? Unconditional, perfect, sacrificial love. Never ends. His resurrection guarantees also that we are his people and will one day be bodily resurrected as well. Uh, and Revelation 1.5 says that Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Firstborn, meaning that there are going to be many more to follow. He's the first of many. Listen, he was resurrected from the dead and all of his people one day will be resurrected from the dead as well. We read in 1 Corinthians 15, he is the first fruits. Uh, meaning, meaning what the first fruits meant was that if the first fruits were good of the harvest, everything coming after it was going to be good too. If the first fruits are bad, you got a bad harvest. If the first fruits are good, you got a good harvest. He's the first fruits, good fruit. And we're going to follow the same way. So if, if, if we're crucified with Christ, if, if we die to the old life in him, we will be resurrected as he was resurrected. Right? If we're united to Christ, who is the head of the body, then the rest of the body, right, the legs, the arms, the fingers, and everything else, the rest of the body will be resurrected as the head was re resurrected. We read in 1 John 3, 2, I love this. He says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. So we don't even really know. We can't comprehend the fullness of what's going to be. But we know this. When he is revealed, that's the second coming, we shall be like him. But we shall see him as he is. It doesn't mean we're going to be God. right? What he means is we're going to have a glorified, resurrected body like he does right now to go with our resurrected soul. We'll be body and soul, pure and holy, right? 
fit for heaven and all glory forevermore. Amen? Amen, right? That's, that's good stuff. Well, he also says in Philippians 3, 20 and 21, for our citizenship, this is really where we live, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're waiting eagerly. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. And what will he do when he comes? Who will transform our lowly body. That's going to probably be in the grave for most of us. Right? Probably dust and ashes at that point. Our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. He's going to give us a body fit for heaven that's going to live forevermore. Immortal. Right? Perfect. Without sin. Without pain and sorrow. And that can never die. So believers will be resurrected. But so too will unbelievers. So too will unbelievers. Listen, if you're sitting here today and you're not a believer in Christ, you're rising too. You're rising too. But the sad reality is not for glory, but for condemnation, but for condemnation. Listen to what we read in Daniel 12. It says, many of those who sleep, and that means in the grave, in the dust of the earth shall awake. Some to everlasting life, right? Those are Christians. And some to shame and everlasting contempt. Unbelievers. They may have called themselves Christians, but they were never born again. Jesus said it in John 5. Do not marvel at this, he said. Do not marvel, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves, that's everybody, will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good, those are believers, to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil, unbelievers, to the resurrection of condemnation. So everybody's, everybody's rising up. No one's missing this one. No one's missing this call. We're all going to be there. So Paul says, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. And remember him when you're pressed by the fire, Timothy, even to the point of despairing for life. Remember him who could not be overcome by death. As one man said, when fears threaten, when doubts arise, when inadequacy depresses, remember the presence of the risen Lord. We need that, right? Remember. So remember his person, secondly, Remember his victory. And finally, remember his gospel. Again in 2 Timothy 2. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. According to my gospel. And my gospel does not mean that Paul invented the gospel, but rather it was the gospel that saved him. It was the gospel that he preached to others and then God used to save them. Uh, and as he would say in Galatians 1.8, there's only one gospel. There's not a lot of gospels floating around out there. There's only one. Uh, and, and the resurrection is an integral part of the gospel. And truthfully, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we don't have a gospel. We have a very inadequate, weak, frail gospel. We got a, a gospel that can't save anybody. Right? We have a gospel that is not good news, which is what the word gospel means. We have a gospel that really is bad news. But Jesus did rise from the grave. And, and the resurrection is the glue to the gospel. It is the glue to the gospel, right? It is what the apostles preach in sermon after sermon in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is when the church is being started, if you will, when the apostles are now sharing the gospel and God is saving souls and the, and the church is starting to be built and grown. And, you, and you, you, you read over like the first 10 chapters, sermon after sermon, you'll, you'll see these couple of uh, uh, ingredients. You killed Jesus, you're a sinner, you deserve death, Jesus paid for it, and he rose from the dead. You'll see the resurrection all over the place. Always, it's the stamp of, 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 of satisfaction and approval of his work. Always. It's what authenticates his life and ministry and, and the plan that God has for salvation. And it never changes because Jesus never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Therefore, in light of that, we can unashamedly preach the gospel and share the gospel and we can trust, we can trust it because because the one who the gospel centers on is alive. Listen, we can share the gospel, gospel people because Jesus is alive today. He ain't dead no more. You know, we're not talking about Muhammad who's been in the grave for like 1,400 years. We're not talking about Pope after Pope after Pope after Pope who's dead in dust right now. We're not talking about gurus and, and even people like me. No, dead. We all die. Jesus is alive. He is alive. So the gospel, the gospel doesn't change because Jesus doesn't change. It never changes. 
So like Paul, we could say, and we must be able to say, my gospel. You have to be able to say, my gospel. Paul said my gospel. He didn't invent it, right? He didn't invent it, but it was my gospel. That's what we have to say, my gospel, because it is the gospel that saved your soul. It is the gospel that saved my soul. It is the gospel that made us new creations in Christ. It is the gospel that has helped us and comforted us all of our saved days. So remember the gospel and continue to promote the gospel. You remember the gospel uh, that it is the sinner's only hope. Listen, don't, don't dance around the message of the gospel because men don't need dancing. They need the truth of the gospel. No one's getting saved by some peripheral message or some, you know, do good this, do good that. They get saved when they hear they're terrible sinners and their sin is going to condemn them before a holy God. And, but Christ came to, to step in and to take the place and to save you. That's what they need. That's what we need. Remember that it is the best news anyone is ever going to hear, whether they know it or not. Right? You know it. They may not. They probably don't. It is better news than winner, winning the lottery or Powerball or whatever else it is. It is better news than getting a bigger house or getting that date with the person that makes your knees a little wobbly. It is better news than all of that stuff. It is better news than hearing, oh, it's not cancer. You're clean and cured. It is better news because it changes everything in this life and it gives you the next one, which is glory unimaginable. So dear brothers and sisters, let us remember Jesus Christ of the seed of David, that he was raised from the dead to help us to live for the one who loved us and gave his life for us and now loves us forevermore. Amen? Well, let me close by leaving you with just two things to remember. And the first one is this. Remember Jesus is alive today and is powerful to save. Remember Jesus is alive today and is powerful to save. Listen, evil abounds in the day we live, right? Wickedness is ramped up in the day we live. And the world goes darker and darker. And men uh, uh, seek deeper and deeper into depravity. Pastor Phil just sent me something the other day. All of a sudden, Budweiser with the Clydesdale. I don't like beer, but I like the Clydesdales. All of a sudden, they're changing the Clydesdales to cows. So now, you know, now we're, we're, we're transforming. You know, we, we've got this, uh, you know, we're no longer horses, we're cows. So just to show how we have changes in our lives. Right? Right, but, but it's crazy. Therefore, remember, even in the midst of all this junk, Jesus is alive and he is seated right now at the Father's right hand and he does have all authority and power in heaven and on earth. And he can save anyone steeped in sin and iniquity. Anyone. He can save the vilest, most vulgar, most horrific, abhorrent person there is. Listen, he could save you if you're unsaved. And some people think, well, you know, I've gone too far. I'm just too hard. My heart is bad. I, you know, I've done so much bad stuff. There's no way. Well, well then, then you'd be the first that he couldn't save. Whoa, -ho, that person, unsavable. Nobody. You just got to know you need to be it. He could save anybody. Listen, he saved Saul of Tarsus who hated Christ, who hated Christians, made it his aim and mission to wipe it out. But then he met Christ on the, on the road to Damascus, and Saul of Tarsus was saved and became the Apostle Paul, the great church planter, the one God used to literally write 13 books of the New Testament, never forgetting that he was a great sinner, would call himself the chief of sinners, if God could save the chief of sinners, who can he save, right? Who can he save? So don't throw in a towel because the same gospel that saved Paul is still saving sinners today. Just be faithful to share it with others and pray and pray that God would unleash the power of the Holy Spirit in their hearts and take the word and put it in and shed the, word, the love of Christ abroad in their heart. Second thing to remember is that because Christ is alive today, it assures us, it assures us of a better life to come. Right? Because he lived among us as one of us and was murdered and raised to life, it shows us there is a better life, a greater life, a more glorious life to come uh, for those who are in him. 
Uh, now, the vast of humanity think this life is it. This is the end all. This is as good as it gets. Uh, that that you've got to get the most out of this one because when this ends, you're done. That's it. And of course, they, they don't want this one to end because that's all they know. Uh, they, they, would, they would love for someone to come back. I read this thing. Someone said, well, no one's ever come back to tell us what the dead is like so that we could know these things. But the truth is, one has. One has come back from the dead. Uh, and he did so before a cloud of witnesses. He did so fulfilling a slew of prophecy. Uh, and he's given us lots of ink about, about life with him after the grave. So it, it, is, it is a wonderful and a glorious life beyond words. So much so that Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 2, he said this, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. You and I can't grasp how wonderful and glorious and magnificent heaven is and, and, and to be in a state of glory and to be resurrected to new and eternal life in the body. We just can't, we, we hear it, we believe it, we trust it, but it's far greater than we can even know. And he says, I don't have words to tell you. When Paul was in the third heaven in 2 Corinthians, I think chapter 12, maybe 11, I forget, he, he said, listen, I was in the third heaven, paradise, that's heaven. He said, and, and I heard things that are not lawful to me. I can't even tell you. I don't have words to tell you. It's just so unbelievable. Does that not encourage us? Not help us persevere now? Well, listen, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, uh, you need to remember that Jesus Christ is alive today and that he rose from the grave. Guess what, though? That guarantees what Paul said about him in 2 Timothy Chapter 4, which is that the Lord Jesus Christ will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Meaning in the end, and there is an end, right? Christ is coming back and all men and you as an unbeliever will stand before Jesus as the judge. And he's not coming back as a lamb, right? To save, he's coming back as a lion to judge. Coming back in power and authority, and he will judge you for every sin you have ever committed in your life. Because every sin was an affront and an offense to a holy God who told you not to sin. They are a breaking of his holy law. And the divine verdict will be guilty. And he will justly cast you into everlasting punishment in a place called hell. And his resurrection, that assures you of that. Right? You can take it to the bank when you don't like it now, but I'm telling you, listen to it now. And I'm not saying this in any other way but in love and fervor for your soul. Right? But here's the thing. You still have breath in your lungs as you sit here today. And you can still cry out for mercy and forgiveness through Jesus Christ. You can plead with him to apply that blood of Christ at Calvary's cross to you to wash away all your sins. And I would urge you to do so today. Don't give rest to your eyes tonight. Let them be soaked with tears of fear and misery and anguish that you're apart from God, pleading with him for forgiveness of your sins. And listen, if you really do cry out for forgiveness, he's going to forgive you. I'm not going to shoo you away. I'll get out of here. You're so bad. No. He's going to say, come. I forgive you. I apply the blood of Jesus to you. Come, now you're my family. And let me bestow my spirit upon you and give you every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Let me shower you with love and goodness so that you can know what it means to live life to the fullest now and have it for all eternity. Will you cry out to God for your sins? Will you confess you're a sinner before a holy God? Will you get on your knees and beg him to save your soul? Or will you leave here today saying, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to stop my life I'm not giving up my boyfriend or girlfriend. I'm not giving up my sexual pleasures. I'm not giving up my life of self and lust of the flesh. I'm not giving that up. Okay, do what you want to do. But today, it's put before you. Trust in Christ. Come to Christ. Plead with forgiveness for your sins and watch what he'll do. Watch what he'll do. Watch how he'll make himself known in your life. Amen? Amen. Listen, if... You want more information about what it means to know Christ, what it means to be born again and saved? You got Pastor Phil, as we say, almost Pastor, Pastor Nick, and really just about a dozen, ten dozen other people here. Ask them. 
Share with me, tell me, pray with me. Amen? Let's pray as the ushers come forward. Father, we thank you for the glorious resurrection. Christ finished the work you gave him to do. He died on the cross. He paid for our sins. He, he made peace between us and you, and he proved it all by rising again. Now seated in heaven at your right hand, waiting to come again to bring us to himself. Lord, how wonderful and glorious are these promises and how joyful it is to be your people today. Oh God, give us more strength. Help us to remember when we're low and when we're struggling and our hearts are weary and we don't seem uh, to be going well and where there seems to be no light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, Lord, show us again that Christ is alive and he is with us now and forever. And Lord, save souls here. Lord, don't let them walk away. Uh, Lord, apart from you, draw them to the Savior, we pray in his name. Amen.